Okay, welcome back to EMC World. This is a Silicon Angle's exclusive coverage of uh, three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage, and I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We've got our famous guest in, in the house, Pat Gelsinger, the CEO of VMware. I had to kind of get that out, and so used to saying EMC. <laughs> um, Pat, welcome back to theCUBE. Hey, thank you very much. Great Dave, to be with you Dave, guys. Dave, we Good asked Pat last year, if you were the CEO of VMware, what would you do, uh, and what would you and Paul talk about? Like, oh, now you got to spin out, you got all this action going on. What happened? <laughs> Tell us, take us through that, that, that uh, transition. Well, uh, you know, Paul, Joe, and I met uh, and a little, you know, over, over a year ago when we started that discussion. And uh, what we realized was that uh, I had a hobby at EMC called Big Data, right, with Green Plum and Pivotal Labs, and Paul had a hobby at uh, VMware called Cloud Apps, and both of us had big day jobs, and neither one of us were putting nearly the amount of attention that this whole cloud big data opportunity really presented. So, uh, and what we realized was that, hey, uh, you know, we did have a great player, and David Goulden to potentially really step up at uh, EMC. You know, Paul, as uh, an operational leader, isn't where, you know, his focus, you know, he's at the point of the career where you know, he's like, to me, he's the Michael Jordan of strategy and technology. And with that, we had him playing baseball, right? Because, you know, running a $5 billion software company is a lot of operational stuff. So it's like, get him back on the basketball court. You know, so Paul to sort of lead this formation, be, you know, maniacal about the opportunity in cloud and big data, really put him in his strength, right, for a huge opportunity as we see it, right? You know, this idea of the next generation data model, this is as big as the transactional database was 25 years ago and you know, it's moved me into the role with VMware is a great opportunity well, for me, so all in all, right, you know, we're well, happy. Well, congratulations, and you're now, you. I know the CEO of a publicly traded company, so maybe you can't be as loose on the queue. Hopefully you can still be the normal Pat Gelsinger. No, but, we have to be <laughs> sullen and boring. So, so, so back in 20, 2010, Dave and I were comparing Paul Moritz. We loved, we loved his mojo, and we called it the, the new Wintel, and then we were actually kind of telegraphing the modern era, and you guys laid out that vision. Um, a lot has changed in the market, so I want to ask you, obviously, you guys made some good bets. Um, the big data thing was happening, big cloud was good there. Um, now he's going to be throwing those three pointers and, and doing those layups now, and is in a good role of pivotal. But how did the world change? I yeah. mean, because that layout in 2010, that map was a legitimate same message here. Top of the stack, what happened? What was going on that made things change where they had to decouple Pivotal? Obviously big data showed up on the doorstep in a big way. What was mm -hmm. the key catalyst between, behind moving that all out? Well, there's a couple of things that have happened. One is, is that you know, what was uh, the f early formative technologies around big data right, have really started to crystallize. And I think as you heard Paul's uh, comments today that the HDFS, the Hadoop space, you know, really is, and I, I don't know that we're quite sure what the equivalent of the transactional SQL ACID compliant database is, but we, we start to see the shape of that, and it's going to be largely around the scale-out, analytic, Hadoop architected framework. So that's starting to crystallize. Second thing that's happened is, right, and as Paul also described, is, is from the consumer internet companies, you've clearly seen that, hey, there's real value here, right? Because who have been the big winners in IT in the last five years? It's all been the consumer internet companies that have really emerged, right, as extraordinarily yeah. powerful. So they've sort of shown what that, you know, if you could, that architectural template is for consumer consumer properties, you know, like Google's, Amazon's, et cetera, but now that needs to occur in the enterprise space. So I'll say those two things have occurred, right, in pretty powerful ways, and now as we look at what we've done with regard to building this underlying infrastructure for cloud that, that truly can scale. Right, you know, it just can scale, right? You know, we can spin up you know, thousands of VMs in a few clicks, in a few seconds, so you have that same kind of dynamic infrastructure that can respond to those big data environments, right, and this emerging big analytic to me, right, you know, big analytic data, bad, right, is what's really going to be a great opportunity for us to monetize just about every industry, right? And the fact that companies like GE are, you know, dropping 100 million bucks into this, I mean, you know, that's like, you know, serious Vegas money, right? That's you good, know, good valuation, only 10% only is good value. <laughs> for them, yeah. they got a good deal. So Pat, yeah, they, they think they're going to make money on this. I plus think they will differentiate oh, yes. their business long term in a powerful way. So now you've got more focus for for VMware. You've gotten rid of you know some of what I call misfit toys. You said they weren't getting enough attention, but you put them into a place where they can get the attention. Who is the new VMware now? Right, who's the new VMware? Well, what we've said is we have three things that we're going to go do, right? And you know, one is we said software-defined data center. We are going to build the infrastructure to virtualize the entire data center. 
right? We're going to do that not just for compute, but for network and security, for storage and availability, and wrap that in the layer of management and automation. So agenda number one, right? Agenda number two is hybrid cloud. We're going to do that for the private cloud, we're going to do it for the public cloud, and we're going to stitch those two together as seamlessly as virtualization allowed VMs to move around you know, separate from the underlying physical server environment. And the third is we're then going to build on that infrastructure to virtualize the end user experience as well, for PCs as well as for this burgeoning BYOD mobile space as well. That's what VMware's going to do, those three things. Okay, so those, that's your new TAM, that's if it. you will. Right, and $50 billion dollar TAM in 2016, right, growing at 20 plus uh, percent. You know, we're not quite a $5 billion dollar company, so that's a great opportunity. You know, the $50 billion dollar market. Okay, so you unpack that a little bit. So $50 billion dollar market's growing much faster than the, the overall IT market. So mm -hmm. that fits in, obviously, to the Joe Tucci model. And Absolutely. <laughs> 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 Excellent. Okay, so um, the other thing that we wanted to talk to you about was this notion of VMware as a cloud provider. Right? Yeah. There's a lot of questions about that. Yeah. You know, I was at the, uh, the EMC Service Providers Conference the other day, moderating a little panel, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and I asked, how do you guys feel about that? And they're like, hey, well, we'll, cooperate, we'll compete, and somebody else said, well, no, they're going to give us the IP, there. so there seemed to be yeah. still some confusion about that, yeah. so help us you know, squint through that and understand what, sure. what your objectives are there. Well, our objective is clearly is to bring this hybrid value proposition to the marketplace, what we call the inside-out model, right? You know, as I said, being able to build an, a hybrid service that is as transparent as the hypervisor was for workloads from one server to another, right? That's our objective of what we're going to do. And we weren't doing that, nor were our service provider partners doing that because we weren't giving them the IP to go do that. So one of the premises is we have is that's the market we're aiming at. The enterprise workload, create that hybrid value proposition. We've decided that, hey, we need to stand up a service ourselves with our brand, our name, our credibility and reputation behind it, right? Because guess what, when you're running a seven by 24 service yourself, you build software differently, right? And I need to build that DNA at VMware that we are building operationalized software that operates there, right, at scale. Secondly, right, you know, with that, we're going to do that you know, we're going to focus on building that software layer and we're going to rely on partners for like the physical infrastructure, for the network infrastructure as well. That will all be done with and through partners. I'm not pouring concrete, I'm not building networks, I'm not going to compete with them at that layer. And then we're going to aggressively franchise that relationship with service providers. Every piece of IP is going to be made available to our partners there, right? Because our customers want our brand on it, but we clearly see that they're going to leverage, right, the service providers as well. And they're going to do all sorts of other services that build on top of ours, some will take it and go do it under their brand as well. We will absolutely be enabling them to go do everything that we're doing, right? And yeah, on the balance, there may be a few accounts that we compete with, but guess what? We've been doing that since the company began with our, with our multi-tier bar relationships, et cetera, because fundamentally we want them to scale dramatically more than we'll ever be able to do so, right, from our position. So it's right to say that you're a catalyst or an accelerant yes. for your partners. Uh -huh. yeah, Absolutely. Okay. That's the right. And I want them to scale, and particularly as you go globally, right, in the American market, it's pretty open, there's lots of competition, Amazon has clearly established himself, but you know, when you start thinking about this and you go to China. How successful will be an international service provider in China? Not going to happen, right? You have to do it with partners. And you know, that to us is a key part of our strategy here. And our VSPP program, you know, where we essentially allow customers to take our software and run it as a service today, right? As we announced in Q1, growing 100% per year. We're already having great traction with that, even though it's small, right? But it's growing uh, very rapidly. So we think we're proven on the business model, right? We're in beta with the service as we speak, and we're getting great response from the early customers for their interest, right, in this with the VMware value proposition. Pat, I got to ask you about the cloud, because obviously we were just at OpenStack Summit, and I saw some OpenStack on the slide there. Yes. Um, so I want to answer about OpenStack. But I also want to talk about some of the comments we heard about the Google comparison. Goulden was up there saying, you know, if you don't want to, you want a Google-like environment, great but you got to hire a thousand PhDs. I mean, the fact of the matter is most enterprises aren't going to be building their own clouds, mm -hmm. right? So they're going to want help there. So obviously that's going to come into your wheelhouse. VMware has to set the table for these guys to have that API, if you will, into from on-prem to the cloud. What, what do you see as your to-do items to check off the boxes to make that uh, happen? In a, in a way that's not Amazon-like, because obviously Amazon's showing the way. Amazon's saying, hey, service levels, I need higher level services, compo uh, compartmentalize them, componentize them, software layers, all that, but enterprises don't want to go to Amazon, so to speak, but they're yeah. doing shadow IT, yeah. so they need to 
partner for the cloud. How do you deliver that? Well, you know, first thing I'd say is, is that many enterprises are building clouds today. They're just called private clouds today, right? And they're operationalizing that. So a lot of this work is actually underway, right? And we see the role of IT evolving to become what we call the service broker. Right, where here are the things that we are doing ourselves, here are the things that we're responsible for that are being done by other parties, right, as well, but we still need to guarantee the SLAs, right, the governance, the data governance, or the, you know, the privacy, all of those types of things, and that's part of IT's responsibility as well. So we, we view that we're trying to enable IT to really be that service broker. Inside of that, we're then trying to say, guess what, there's a whole nother bag of tools that we want to start enabling that are these public cloud or these hybrid cloud services that we want to enable, right, those service availability for that environment with you. But we're going to do it with the same networking, the same security, the same management tools, the same, right, compatibility, so you don't need to make this radical step to an incompatible public cloud service that when you get there, right, you're now in an, another locked in environment, you know, Dr. Lock-in, as we saw at the show here today. Dr. Lock-in. And then you can't come back, right? And that's the problem with shadow IT, and as we talk to CIOs, right, you know, hey, you know, it's just a swipe of the Amex card, and I'm able to go, you know, provision some VMs, but now that you've done the app development over there, now what do I do with it? I can't deploy they it need portability. in my governance, I can't put the SLAs against okay, it. Okay, so that private I mean. cloud is, is the gateway towards, you know, a fully interface where we go to some VMware services when they're cloud, your cloud. Um, but I want to ask you, why do you think OpenStack is so successful? I mean, OpenStack mm -hmm. is young. I mean, you got cloud stacks out there, a mm -hmm. little bit more advanced, but OpenStack is resonating with the enterprise. Why is that? Well, you know, first thing is, you know, let, let's put this in context a little bit, right? You know, OpenStack is not being successful, right, you know, in terms of real deployments. It's nascent, right? It's early in the hype cycle, but absolutely it's, it's generating lots of interest. You know, people are saying, wow, what's going on here? And certainly and developers are. Yeah, are uh, you know, so there's a lot of interest going on here, and you know, why, why is that? Yeah, that's right. The, right, and I think that's the more fundamental question. Yes, that's right. It's not a measure of real deployments today because they know, don't really like, exist. Right, they, they don't exist. And the interest is because there's so much interest in this whole cloud space, right? They realize these public clouds, they're, you know, they're incompatible, they're proprietary, I can't operationalize them internally. You know, there's now you know, the great success of VMware internally, but we haven't presented this ability to have a compatible set of services across okay, those environments. Okay, so let me re rephrase the question. So, obviously, it's early, so the messaging of OpenStack is resonating with Absolutely. enterprises. Absolutely. Is it do you think it's because of demand or because of their approach? Um, I, I think there is a, a bit of both, right? There is this unsatisfied need, and I'll tell you, as I talk to CIOs, there's an unsatisfied need in this hybrid space, and that's what we are aggressively stepping into, point one. Point two would be, hey, you know, this is an open store, open source, right? You know, people don't want Dr. Lockett. They want to have some governance that allows them to say, okay, I really can move, I have this flexibility. And that's why we made the announcements we did at the OpenStack Summit. Yeah. You were there, yeah. you saw yeah. our announcements, right? Yeah. You reported on it as well, saying, hey, you know, we have two strategies strategies, right? We're going to build our complete stack, right? We're going to operationalize yep. it, we're going to allow people to run private clouds, but we're also going to have a component strategy <coughs> where we will follow the OpenStack APIs, we'll make our networking, we're going to make our hypervisor, we're going to make our management, right? And you'll see us make other announcements of supporting of our technologies into that space as well, because CIOs, right, and architects are very concerned for lock-in. Right, they're very concerned that there is competition because that's what they've lived in for the last 25, 30 years, and they don't want to position themselves that in this cloud world, I've just created yet another set of lock-in. So we think it yeah. very much is important in that respect, and that's why we're fully supporting it. And you're contributing. It. To Absolutely. To OpenStack, right. obviously. Yeah, we're one of the large contributors, side. we're right. contributing at those three levels, and you'll see us make more steps But a lot well. of people are afraid. They yeah. say, oh, VMware's coming in. You know, they're going to try to slow us down. What do you tell those people? What I tell people, I'm contributing code. Right, I'm ready to go govern, right, in that space, I'm ready to go be part of the governance process just like OpenStack is set up, that's why we joined the board, that's why we're making code contributions, and guess what, right, what's the largest deployed OpenStack today? Probably Rackspace. Yeah, cloud, right? Probably, probably Rackspace. Yeah. Whose network are they running? Mine. Right, you know, what's one of the other largest open <laughs> yeah, yeah. stack environments is uh, PayPal, eBay, right? Whose hypervisor are they running? Mine. You know, I think we're already mm. proving that we are a valid partner of somebody who's chosen an open okay. stack architectural framework, right, that we are going to make our technologies absolutely suitable for those environments so, so as I gotta, well. I got to ask you two questions about the positioning of, of VMware and how you're going to market the company. I know you got a CMO uh, search out right now and... Uh, Have you applied yet? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, okay. no. Oh, maybe. <laughs> I, I don't think I'd pass the background <laughs> check. Uh, <laughs> The cube, being on the cube and everything. <laughs> um, the riff raff here on the cube. Um, so something in your background I should know about? 
out here. <laughs> I'm boring. I've four kids live in Palo Alto, <laughs> and nothing to see there. Um, so you know, we want to hear about the positioning, but also I want to take you back in the memory lane. Okay, back in the '80s and '90s, um, the big thing was multi-vendor. Mm -hmm. That was the open standards initiative drove that, and um, that worked. That was a box mentality, right? That was components. I got to have this. I got to have that. I got to work together. I have an interoperable uh, multi-vendor. Now it's about openness. Yeah. So is open and choice the new multi-vendor? And how would you compare and contrast that kind of box mentality to this kind of version of multi-vendor or open? Is it? How would uh -huh. you talk about that? Well, we we would talk about it maybe from a couple of lenses. One is clearly there is this view of give me open interfaces, give me these you know lighter weight, restful interfaces, so I don't get quote you know these heavy things that lock me in, right? Secondly, we do think the software-defined data center is just a big big deal, right? Because we are taking you all know, say you know hardware heavy, right, and putting lightweight interfaces on it that are more programmable, more agile, et cetera, uh, on top of that. And we're generally finding that IT wants few vendors, right? You know, they don't want lots and lots of little things, right? They want to pick trusted partners that they can go build their next generation infrastructure on. So in many regards, we're seeing, you know, CAOs say, boy, you know, if I trust you, if I want to partner with you, if I see you work the right way and do the right things, you know, I actually want fewer vendors. Uh, yeah. going forward. And it's on the choice side, because that's a big message you guys have here at EMC yeah. World, which has really um, you know, been well received. Yeah. Um, is that, how does you, how do you look at the choice? Is it technical choice? Is it vendor choice? Yes and yes. And, and part of it is, you know, and for that, I would say to me, it is architectural choice, right, at both the technology and at the business model level. Right, because that's part of the way we set the company up the way that we do. Guess what, you know, Tom Jorgens of NetApp is one of my best friends, right, in this space. He's one of the best innovative partners for VMware. That is the case today, and I expect it to be the case for many, many years to come. Right, and he's the arch rival of EMC. Right, you know, that is the way we structure Yeah, we have video companies. of you with a NetApp t-shirt on. Yeah, NetApp yeah, baseball shirt. That <laughs> ecosystem is a key differentiator, right? Absolutely, I mean, that is, absolutely. And that's part of the reason. the ecosystem partner. Yeah, and that's I mean, part of the reason that we can go into the space with such confidence and have no fear of OpenStack. Because we contribute to these open ecosystems all the Cloud time. Cloud Foundry's involved. All the time, you know, I go to my, you know, we're competing viciously with Citrix, right? Please bring NetScaler on top of the uh, NSX platform uh, as you go forward. You know, who distributes N1K? Right, you know, for virtual networking for Cisco, we do. Right, you know, we believe this has to be an open platform, open interfaces, and the way we structure the company, right, you know, and Joe is governing well in that regard. Is we fully realize that hey, we have yeah. to enable, right, you know, the choice. You know, best technologies have to win on open platforms. Who will be, right, my partners in the in the Hadoop space? Well, certainly Pivotal will be, but guess what? You know, Cloudera, Mapbar, they're going to be key partners. Yeah, as it's, well. it's an ecosystem, and Joe was very proud up there to say, hey, we have a, a, a different approach, our differentiation is we do have four brands. Absolutely. And so with mm -hmm. that, what is going to be the- It's not just four brands, it's four companies. Four companies. With independent focus and charters. What's, what's going to be the new VMware positioning from your standpoint? Because you've got some separation now. You've got the top of the stack has kind of been pushed out with Pivotal. Yeah, well, our, you know, our positioning will very much you know, continue to evolve as the, the you know, IT as a service, infrastructure company of choice, right? Software-defined data center, hybrid cloud, and user computing, build that infrastructure, right, for anything associated with infrastructure going forward. We are the software infrastructure of the future. Okay, got Pat Gelsing, we're getting the hook from the handlers, and uh, this is uh, always the case, we try to have, uh, hang on. We didn't run out of questions, Dave, we, had, we have more. <laughs> we'll get them later. Pat Gelsing, you're always a great guest. Thanks for coming on Side the Cube right. again. Uh, congratulations, CEO very of VMware. Obviously, major, major inflection point for EMC and all the, the companies, Pivotal, VMware, and RSA. Great job, uh, congratulations, and uh, we right back with our next guest after this short break.